So here we are again. Imagine a film which is two films. Okay. Um, imagine two films which are actually one film. No, that's not right. Okay, it's all of them. This is one film. It's also two films. And on top of that, it's one film which is two films. And it's two films which are also one film. And that one film is called Tropical Melody, and it's directed by the Thai director Apichat Pong Virasatakul. And I apologise to Thai speakers for butchering the pronunciation of his name. The first film is, I was going to say, a relatively straightforward love story between uh, two male characters. It's not really that straightforward. Um, it's shot in Apichapong's uh, sort of normal, uh, dreamlike style. It's not, it's not narrative driven, it's more character driven, and the character is often manifested through uh, shots of, of nature and of uh, seemingly unconnected happenings. Because character isn't just your action, character is your thought, your beliefs, your family, your friends. Character is much broader than, than just a, a simple materialist uh, set of actions upon the world. <clears throat> the second film is, is a silent film. And by that I mean it's not silent. There's sounds in it, there's a lot of sounds, there's a lot of jungle sounds particularly. There's even some dialogue in particular at one point. A, uh, an, an ape of some kind uh, comes and speaks to one of the protagonists. Um, I think the protagonist might utter some words, I think he speaks on his, on his radio. Um, but the Dialogue doesn't particularly drive the story, it doesn't really do an enormous amount to illuminate who the characters are. What the dialogue what the dialogue does is it, it, it sort of sheds light on some aspects of the story, but it doesn't drive the story. What drives the story are the the actual actions and the, the intertitles. Um, the film will keep fading to black and then an intertitle will come up which will tell you what the next stage of the story is and what's happening. <coughs> and it will also explain where a section of the story is, for instance, a, a flashback or a story within the story. And I've completely and utterly forgotten the title of the second <coughs> uh, film. But the, both both parts are tropical malady, and both parts have the same two central uh, actors whose names I will stick in the credits <laughs> um, because I haven't done done my research. I mean, I, I know what the names are, but I haven't actually bothered to learn them or find out the pronunciation. <coughs> so let's go back and and recount sort of what's happening and, and see what ideas pull out of that. The first, the first film, or the first part of the film, uh, opens, uh, I think it might open actually in the jungle or in the, in the countryside. I think there may be scenes sort of outside where the main action happens. But, uh, and, and that includes uh, footage that at this stage isn't particularly explained of a, of a naked man wandering across uh, a field or a gap in forest. Like, you can't tell, it's, it's just all, all green. But it fairly quickly cuts to the city and most of it takes place in the city, either out on the streets or in interiors. Uh, occasionally ventures out of the city, but a lot of that is, again, within buildings and people's houses. <coughs> uh, 
And there are two central, two central characters. There is a, a troop of soldiers uh, who are who are on patrol in the jungle, and one of them is our main focus. And there is a a young man who is living, I think, with his family, perhaps not his parents. And these two, it becomes apparent, are, are lovers, and we follow their stories. Nothing, nothing much in particular happens in, t in terms of if you're looking for, for plot or action or conflict, um, which is it's obviously your, your conventional uh, storytelling paradigm for most uh, movies that you'll go and see at the, at the, at the cinema. Now there are, I think, three cinematographers on, on across the whole film. I don't know who's responsible for which bits, but there there were moments in the first section. I think it was possibly slightly also to do with uh, with the editing, uh, but particularly with with the lighting. That there were moments, fleetingly. In, in the first section, where I thought uh, quite a lot of, of Chris Doyle's work for Wong Kar Wai. Um, but it, it really wasn't quite the same. And, uh, and for me, whoever was, was handling the cinematography, there, there wasn't a, a, a noticeable change in quality once you moved from the uh, the city to the countryside. What I found sometimes with with Chris Doyle's work is that he's much more convincing with uh, interiors, with artificial light, with cities, than he is with uh, countryside. It's not that he's bad. It's just that he doesn't convince quite as much. But here, whoever was handling which duties, it it, it worked both uh, outside with natural light and inside with, or on the streets, with, with artificial light. Essentially, the story really is the soldier pursuing the farm boy. It's not that the farm boy is unwilling, the farm boy is, is very willing, and you get a sense later uh, in, in, in the story, certainly in the, in the, in the first half, that in essence, the farm boy is also kind of playing games. He's deliberately drawing him, drawing the soldier on, and it's a very convincing uh, romance. There's no particular kissing or embracing. There's no, uh, there's no sex scenes, um, but it 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 certainly is much more convincing as a a kind of physically and particularly emotionally intimate relationship uh, than other films which might be uh, more explicit. It doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't need that explicitness. Uh, there's not a lot I can say about the story, there are just incidents. The, the, the young men meet a woman who leads them into a, a kind of underground cave which is connected to a temple. They go they go there. They meet another woman. They spend some time in in bars where there's popular music or, or romantic music playing. They spend time together. They sit looking at the jungle. They talk, um, and that's about it. But it it is. It's incredibly compelling, and it, it for me it, it's a, it's a perfect illustration of why I think, and this is something I've already talked about previously. Why I think anyone who talks about not wanting spoilers for films is is completely missing the point of of the medium, or or of, or of any any storytelling medium really. I could tell you every plot beat, I could tell you exactly what happens at what moment, but 
it wouldn't tell you anything about, or it would tell you a very limited amount about the film, because there is so much more in the film. The film is is made up of, it's, it's made up of that, that that temporal experience of following it through from the beginning for as, as long as it takes. It, it also is made up of, of the cinematography, of the shots, how, how the shots are composed, what's included in the frame, <coughs> how long shots take, how they're edited together, the acting, people's expressions, people's people's faces. There's uh, a kind of inconclusive scene at one moment, at, at, at one point in the first, the first section, where the farm boy is on a bus and he appears to be mutually flirting with the girl across the way from him. And this goes on for quite some time. Uh, and it, it includes some uh, fourth wall breaking, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. And that could be imported from or dropped into a, a much more conventional uh, heterosexual love story. It's never explored, that relationship is never examined any further. You don't know who the young woman is, you don't know, is she, is, is, is she like the, uh, like the farm boy, is she, is she homosexual, she, she might not, you know, there's nothing actually there other than this, this flirting to say that she's actually heterosexual, do we know that the farm boy is homosexual, he might well be bisexual, you know, there's a fluidity, there's a, a refusal to pin things down, pin things down to issues and to definitive statements. And uh, I think that's admirable. I think it's much more interesting when th th there's all the hinterland, all this hinterland, when there's this sense of, of things that you, you don't know and you're not told. And, you know, you're having to Sort of rely on assumptions and then you start to, to question the assumptions that you're making because you, you, you think how would this thing play in another film, how would this relationship play in another film, you know, how would you, how would, you know, a, a conventional action film portray this and, and you're aware that while the film is interested in the relationship and it's interested the relationships and it's interested in the characters. It's not a, it's not a homosexual film. It's not about an issue. It's not. Uh, it's not about particular problems. It's it's about that relationship, and it doesn't much matter who the the two protagonists are. And I've I've sort of slipped from <laughs> talking about this particular scene into talking about the. Uh, the, the, the two the two male leads uh, <laughs> kind of very seamlessly and and I'm sure confusing them. So coming back to the scene on the bus, uh, the farm boy and, and the young woman uh, flirting that gets interrupted by the soldier who is in a, a truck that, that stops. Uh, next to the bus, he leans in, taps the, the farm boy on the shoulder, and they have a conversation. And it's the, the, the sort of farm boy uh, escaping again, um, seeing really kind of playing these relationship games where he leads leads the soldier on a little. Now I said I was going to talk about fourth wall breaking. Uh, there's, there is, there is quite a bit of it. Um, there, there are particular scenes. I watched this on, on DVD. This is an old film. It's eleven years old. It came out in two thousand and four. And going by internal evidence, uh, a calendar which comes up in one shot. It, it was possibly filmed in two thousand and three. So it's kind of twelve years old in, in that sense. Um, but. The DVD title screen is a scene from the first part of the film, and it's it's the soldier sitting and 
I don't know if it's ever clear that he is directly flirting with the farm by. I don't think you ever see who he's looking at, but he's, he's sitting on a veranda at night. There's sort of jungle sounds and the like around. And, and you're just watching him sitting, and he's looking off to one, one side, looking off to the other, and occasionally looking directly at the camera and smiling. And so you... you that, that scene crops up later in the film. As I say, that doesn't... I don't remember that having the farm boy in it. I think it is just a concentration on, on the soldier, which would be kind of true to the rest of the film, in that the, the farm boy does reciprocate. He does show uh, interest and affection and love for the soldier, but he, he's much more in the position of, of leading the soldier on, of kind of seeming to resist and, and, and back away, but at the same time uh, beckoning him on. And also, it, 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 doing it that way makes it kind of an analogue with the scene on the bus, but, but not directly or or it's obviously so, you don't have the same back and forth. That scene, particularly on the bus, has quite long scenes looking at, at the young woman, quite long scenes looking at the farm boy, but it, it keeps cutting back and forth between them for quite some time. And there, there, there are incidents, she takes a phone call, but keeps, keeps looking at the farm boy, and then he he gets interrupted, and that's more or less the end of that scene. Uh, and there, there, there are, I think, some other incidents. The only one I can think of offhand, and it's not in the, in the same sense fourth wall breaking, but where you have a, a tiger in the second part, which is face onto the camera. So, I've spoken quite a bit now about the first half, and I'm sure there are other things that will, will, will come to mind. I mean, I, I saw this film yesterday, last night, uh, and as always with these reviews, I didn't, didn't make any notes. Uh, I did um, the most cursory of research, uh, and so I, I've come here without a script. And again, as I always do, to, to give my uh, subjective opinions. So. Yeah, things will probably pop up into my brain, hopefully while I'm still reviewing. <laughs> if not, then it'll be too late because I'll have decided <laughs> that this is the take uh, and I'll have uh, uploaded it onto my computer for, for editing later. So, the, the second half. The second half essentially starts with uh, a story of a... Of a shaman who can take the shape of a tiger and is killing villages, villagers and, and their livestock. And that's essentially it. That's as much as we that's as much as we ever know. And we're introduced to uh, the soldier who is on his own. It's, it's the same actor, it's the same soldier, and, but he's on his own for most of the uh, most of the second half. There's not, there's only <coughs> only one other character who who sort of has a couple of other manifest. Well, you've also got the ape, um, but, but apart from the ape, there's really only one other character, but one who has a couple of other manifestations. Um, and you're either told directly, or you at least get the sense that the the soldier is hunting down, is trying to capture or kill uh, the shaman who has uh, recently killed uh, another another cow owned by one of the villagers. And so most of this. This, this section of the film, this film on its own, is is him 
wandering around the jungle trying to hunt this shaman, this tiger, who you don't see a great deal of. Until you, you you don't see a great deal of uh, the shaman, the tiger, until we get possibly about halfway through when the farm boy, who we saw earlier, who this time is, is kind of covered in, in, in writing and, and tattoos and, and marks, who is the, the, the shape-shifting shaman, uh, turns up and the two men kind of have a tussle uh, and the, the soldier gets gets his, his backpack taken off him and he gets thrown off a cliff. <coughs> he manages to, to climb back up and starts the pursuit again and it's at this point that the that the, 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 the ape tells the soldier that he's not hunting the shaman, he's being hunted by the shaman and gradually the two through this, this mutual pursuit come together and the shaman is in, in the form of a tiger <coughs> and the soldier seems to, to give himself up and there's some talk about them devouring each other which obviously you can take as as symbolic as sexual as uh, you know in in in, in a few or, or as literal you, you know you can take it in a few ways and and that's where the film ends it it, it is much more uh, elusive and much more allusive than explanatory it doesn't it doesn't tell you what to think it doesn't tell you what happened now, coincidentally, this is, this is something I, I wanted to, to, to observe. It reminded me, I, coincidentally, I've been reading uh, Angela Carter's uh, collection of short stories, The Bloody Chamber, and it reminded me very much of some of the, the, the themes of, of transformation in those, particularly in the kind of final three uh, stories about um, wolves and... Uh, transformation and about the relationships between uh, the two the, the two characters in, in, in either of those films films short stories although one of them was turned into a company of wolves which I haven't seen so I can't I can't venture there I can't comment on on, on that film um, but it's a similar thing there that they they are rich and dense and elusive, and they draw on on folk sources. They draw on traditional sources. They draw on sensuality. They're they're imbued with a sense of of sexuality. With the Angela Carter things, it's more a case of. Uh, awakening sexuality, whereas uh, with with um, tropical malady, it's it's more as though the the, the sexuality is, is kind of not fully mature, but it's it's mature. It's already there. It's accepted and understood. Um, but th there there are some in, in interesting and instructive parallels, which if I'd had more time or, or preparation, I would have thought about and expounded on. Uh, what I did find uh, interesting, having seen this film really out of sequence uh, with uh, with Dapper Chapman's other films, <coughs> is is the the kind of echoes um, that, that um, come between them. I think the first I've read a lot of reviews of his work. But I think the first film of his that I saw was it was either Blissfully Yours on DVD, which I would have bought for a friend as a, as a Christmas present, or yeah, it must have been that. And then, then I saw uh, 
uh, Uncle Boomy, who can recall his past lives, which came out in 2006, so it was two years later than than the Tropical Malady. Uh, I, I, I love Uncle Boomy, but there were a lot of scenes, particularly with the military uh, hunting, hunting. They seem to be hunting this sham and make find a. a that, that's where it opens at the start. They they found a dead body and they're taking photos with it. Uh, those scenes, also the, the the naked shaman wandering through the greenery, scenes of cattle wandering about, and and there's the ghost of a of a cow which wanders off into the jungle in the, in the second part, which the uh, soldier follows, which is is similar to a scene where. It, uh, a cow, not a ghost of a cow, but a cow uh, wanders off during during Uncle Boomy. So there were echoes throughout of of the later film. Although this feels, in a sense, much more. I was going to say much more conventional. It, it it's not really not conventional, but the the scenes aren't as long. The scenes are slightly more direct. It's not quite as. Uh, as, as, as disincorporated as, as Uncle Boomy is. Uh, and I, I would recommend both films. I, I would probably recommend as a, uh, as a place to start Tropical Malady because I'm going straight into Uncle Boomy might be a bit, uh, a, a bit much of an experience. There is also a reference to a character who, who can recall his past lives that, that, that the two the two male protagonists discuss uh, during the first section of the film, which clearly is the story from which Uncle Boomy uh, comes. I believe that was based on a, a novel. So that, that idea is clearly already percolating. There's also a scene late on in, in Uncle Boomy where the protagonists again travel into a travel into a cave, which is where Uncle Boomy will die. So that there, there's some significance, although it's not, not clear to me quite what, to, to caves, to these cooler, darker, quieter spaces, away from the jungle, away from the city. There, the, the um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I have nothing more to say about that. There, there is. Uh, an interesting moment in the uh, first part of, of Tropical Malady where, where they're travelling into, into a cave with the, uh, with, with the, the, the middle-aged woman and there's a, a passage which she tells them will, will put out um, the light and they say, is it because there's, there's no air and it'll, it'll put out a candle and she says, no, uh, your torch will will go out. Uh, and Farm Boy is, is very willing to, to, to go and take that, that take that journey which takes you to another, another section of the, of the cave. The soldier is is afraid. He it's never clear whether he's uh, claustrophobic or afraid of the dark or, or something else. Or it, or it wasn't apparent to, to me anyway. Um, which is, and, and, and that's different from Uncle Boomy. I'm not aware of anyone being particularly afraid of, of, of the dark or even the supernatural happenings, particularly in, in that film. Uh, I was wondering if the, the mention of the, of, of the candles and, and even flashlights going out would play into, into, into the film later on, if it would perhaps emerge in the second part. It, it doesn't seem to, or at least not in a big, kind of obvious narrative sense. There's no, there's no scene where you think, ah, yes, that's an echo. It, it's fair enough. I, I don't, I'm, I'm sort of glad about that. There, there are plenty of other echoes and, and interesting depths to the film without doing these sort of simple uh, Chekhov's gun things. <laughs> really, I, 
I'm, I'm sure this is the world's most useless review because all I've done is give you little uh, snippets of events that happen whilst telling you that they're kind of not important. What's important to the performances, the the editing, the camera work, how to move things, look, the colours, the ideas, the things that that, that 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 seep out of the film. It is it is most definitely and 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 uh, like Uncle Boon Me and like many of the best films I like, it is a for me a film in the truest sense. A lot of films strike me as they're sort of filmed books, or they're filmed plays, or they're filmed synopses. They're very much story-driven. Sometimes character will be tacked on, usually with an unrealistic uh, kind of arc. Uh, people learn something, people learn from their errors, or they improve themselves, or they discover value of relationships. Which Strictly speaking, in terms of how life is and, and how we experience things, it is, is bullshit, to be honest. This, this isn't bullshit. I mean, on the surface, it's much more, it is much more bullshit. Um, certainly the second half is fantastical. It's someone hunting a phantasmagorical, shape-shifting shaman. And it, it confuses, uh, deliberately confuses, sort of magic with reality, with metaphor. And it doesn't give you any key to, to unpick that and to say how you should take which section. Which is, is, is very, much to its, very much to its credit. Um, the film is, is, is much more... It's much more true by refusing those simple uh, narrative pleasures, those 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 little little tricks that we're so accustomed to. And really, all I can say is is get it if you can find it streaming, then go and, and, and see it there. If you want to get a DVD or, or Blu-ray, do that. Get it. If it comes to to a, a cinema near you, definitely go and see it and, and check out anything by um, t today by Apishat Pong uh, Virasat Pong again apologies for mispronunciation uh, anything he he's a, a fantastic um, filmmaker he also does uh, installations and and sort of art on, on, on other platforms so yeah most definitely find it, watch it, form your own opinions, read about it if, if, if need be. Um, and yeah, that's, that's me out.